Welcome. My name is Lucy Kimball. I'm director of the UAL Innovation Insights Hub, which is a sort of research hub, uh, research group based here at King's Cross. I'll do a brief introduction and then we'll have each of the speakers uh, speak in turn for about 10 minutes um, and then we'll have Q&A uh, with you um, and we may be finished in about an hour or slightly longer. Okay. Can I just check who here is not from UAL? Okay. So we have a few external people. Thank you. The other thing I should mention is that the, we're audio recording this so that if you do ask a question later, your question um, will, will also be recorded. Um, so if you're not happy about that... Um, don't ask questions. <laughs> oh, write it on a piece, it on a piece of paper and, yeah, and pass it to me, okay? Um, the reason we do the audio recording is because um, there's a larger audience interested in these topics and to have this quite interesting group of people, it seemed to actually useful to, to put that and stick it on the web for a larger audience. So um, hopefully you've had a chance to read the introduction that we put online earlier, so I'm not going to repeat that. I'm just going to briefly pose the question, why are we even talking about business models um, in an art and design institution? Um, um, so one, one reason is that in um, some art and design practice, do come in, grab a seat, in much art and design practice, um, people are actually thinking through making about systems, ontologies, connections, um, networks, and thinking about value relations through their work, through their practice. So the nature of business models, service models, um, operational models, the underlying value logics is quite often built into um, some aspects of certainly design practice and to some extent some art practice. The second reason we might talk about it in an art and design school is that we do have researchers, including people gathered here today, who are active as researchers in this area already. Um, um, and then the third reason um, is more um, uh, uh, sort of an occasion, is that um, UAL is one of um, 11 partners in a European-funded project which is called Creative Lenses, which is over four years um, exploring but also trying out uh, new business models in arts and cult cultural venues across Europe. Um, and if you want to know more about that, look online um, for creativelenses.eu or, um, or look at the UAL bit of the website uh, or come and talk to me afterwards. So. Um, I'm going to start today with Jamie Brassett, who's going to um, give us a philosophical perspective on business models. Um, Jamie, as you may know, is a reader in philosophy, design and innovation here at CSM, and for many years has been the course leader of the MA Innovation Management, um, which I would say as, a, as one of the few courses in CSM, which uh, in the UAL generally, that is actually explicitly thinking about um, current and future business models and how those might be changed and disrupted. So uh, I'll, ask each, I'll introduce the other speakers um, ahead of when they speak. So if we could turn now oh, to straight, in. straight into Jamie. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. Um, when Lucy asked me about this uh, this, this topic for this, this talk this afternoon. I said, yeah, I'm happy to come along and chat, but you know what you're going to get from me? You're going to get some sort of philosophical stuff. You know, I might talk about ontologies of business models. Was like, yeah, 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 okay. Then I was like, oh, right, okay. So now I've got to try and talk about the ontologies of business models. Um, I, think I'm, I think I'm going to uh, do so in, in three ways, or, or by, by focusing on uh, three different things. The first is to uh, talk about a model, uh, what is a model. Um, the next, I was going to think about business. Um, and then, if I get a chance, I'll talk about um, imaginaries. Um, and maybe weave in some stuff about uh, innovation or innovation management as we go along. Um, but if I forget, I'm sure there's a few people here who might ask such a question. Um, so first, I, I, I think I'd like to talk about models. So um, I'm wondering, uh, what is the ontological status of a model? And when I say ontological status, I'm thinking, uh, what is it in reality? What is it, the nature of its existence? Um, if we say that we are modelling something, um, we are making a claim about the relationship between the model and the thing modelled. 
Um, and I'm not entirely sure what the nature of that relationship is, because very often um, the, uh, the model exists in a different type of reality using different types of material um, than what is being modelled. And so what we have with the sense of a model is that there is something going on somewhere um, that we are supposed to be able to read or follow in such a way that uh, we can then translate or express or um, understand in a completely different area. And we are, meant to, uh, we are meant to know or we are meant to be able to uh, work out how it is that our, our work, our creativity, our insights um, or our activities in one level of reality is meant to have an impact in another level of reality. So I'm wondering, what is this, what is this thing called a mod model and what, is it, what does it do and what is it for? I think I'd also like to talk about business. And I can see quite a few people in the audience whom I recognize um, as students from my course. So um, apologies to you people, you've heard this all before. And you've probably heard it before and you've heard me say at the same time, I bet I've told you this before, but I'm gonna say it again anyway. But I. Many of you have heard this before, but I'm going to say this again anyway. So, business. What is a business? Um, I'm quite interested in, as some of you will know, I'm quite interested in this idea of a business. Um, and it's a phrase that comes from the, the, the late 17th century. And uh, it describes a business as a concern, or even a going concern. And I think, Lorna, with your... Um, accounting background will understand very well what, um, what accountants mean when thinking about um, a business as a going concern, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's something like um, a, a, a business in which will not enter liquidation within the first, or within the next year. Something Ish. like that. That'll do. Okay, we'll work That'll with that. Um, that's, the, that's, that's one of the official official ways of thinking about it. But this is, this is I say, is, a, is, a, um, is an idea, uh, a use of the, the word concern that has been around in English since the end of the 17th century. Um, fairly recently, uh, the philosopher and sociolo sociologist of science taught um, about design. He said, design is no longer about matters of fact, but matters of concern. Um, Bruno Latour said that, 2008. I was there, um, just saying. Um, he, uh, he, said, he said this, and um, in my philosophical ramblings, um, I found a philosopher who um, Bruno Latour is, is very um, influenced by, but he doesn't reference in matters of concern when he said it about design. Uh, it's the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead who also talks about matters of concern. He says that, that philosophy too should be about matters of concern. And he says that a concern, um, he uses it, uh, Whitehead, um, early 20th century, he uses concern in the Quaker sense, um, the Society of Friends, the, um, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the offshoots of Christianity. Um, and the Quakers use concern as, um, as a divinely inspired and deeply felt call to action, which I think is marvellous. Um, so if we, we, we don't have to have the divinely inspired, but we can keep the deeply felt call to action um, in this notion of a concern. So if I'm thinking of a business as a going concern, and I'm thinking of design also as dealing with matters of concern. Um, and I'm thinking that a concern is a deeply felt call to action. Um, then I'm thinking very differently about what the ontological status, what, what it is 
what business is. Um, a business like design or designing um, is a creative response to a deeply felt, um, a deeply felt urge to do something, uh, to, to make an impact or make a difference. Um, so I wonder for any designer or any business person, um, what is calling you to action? Um, and how is it that your action is, uh, is going to be manifest in the way that you wish it to be? Now let's think then about a business model. How can one model one's creative response to a call to action? And how is it that one's model of one's resp creative response to a call to action can help us act? Um, what, is the, what is that mode or method of expression or translation between those two ontologies or those two, uh, two realities that can, um, that can help us in acting? Um, and making an action. How long have I got? Two minutes. Two minutes. So then let's also consider about imagination um, and wonder what the imaginary might be. And um, maybe is this a place where we can bring together the, um, the ontology, the different ontologies of um, acting and modelling that action. Um, is that in the imagination or as, as a creative imaginative act that we operate within a space of, of reality or a space of action um, that makes the model and the business um, the same thing? And I think my example of this um, would be, um, and it's something that I've talked with, with Yoshi um, about before, um, is um, sometimes I think entrepreneurs, for example, uh, their, their prototyping of a business model um, is the business itself. Um, and the the act of modelling and the act of creating a, um, a, a different ontology of what it is that they're doing, how it is that they're acting, that, those come together in the act of entrepreneurship, I think. Um, there, is a, there is a moment in entrepreneurs' um, lives when if you think about, um, or is it agile or... One of these, one of these things, where they, where they have this thing called the pivot, where lean after startup. Is it lean, lean startup. startup, that's it. Thank you. Um, it was one of those faddish things, but anyway, lean startup. Um, you have this, uh, this, this, this idea of a pivot, where um, the the founders of a new of a new business will stop, spin round, and look at how it's been, how it's been acting and whether they need to make any changes uh, to, to what it is they set out to do in the first place. Um, that, to me, is the sort of, um, the, the similar sort of act that somebody who is modelling, um, who is modelling a business, um, and maybe even prototyping as part of that modelling the business and looking to see how it runs, um, to then to... Uh, reflect, critically reflect and make any changes that they might need to. Um, I see that sort of act of um, starting up, making run, uh, pivoting and, um, and reflecting and changing. Um, uh, I, I see that as, as being a, almost what, what Alfred North Whitehead would say is an imminent, imminent uh, modelling of a business, whether the model and the business are coming together. <laughs> and you were done? Yeah. And we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, so thank you, Jamie, for a very eloquent and erudite kickoff to uh, our three terms gathered together. We're now going to move to um, <coughs> Yoshi Amano, who is one of Jamie's PhD students, who is about to finish 
Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yes. Um, who's going to share with us um, his research um, over the last three years in business model innovation located um, in an art school as a, as a site of doing that research and resulting in mm -hmm. um, a very <coughs> practical, ontological realization of the research. Thank you. Thank you for coming. So, um, yeah, my name is Tsuyoshi Amano. So, basically, I'm doing um, PhD research about how to prototype business models. Then, um, I've done like kind of case studies and expert interviews. Then, so I, I sort of made, I, I synthesized findings into a kind of four dimensions framework of business models, uh, business model prototyping. So there are purpose and process and engagement and context. Then, um, actually, I would like to talk about, I mean, recently I've been developing kind of card-based uh, prototyping tool for business model innovation called Stretch. So um, I would like to focus on uh, process part in business model prototyping for this talk. So, so basically, I think there are two challenges in business model innovation process. Um, so one thing is agility. So basically, how, how quickly you can get um, feedback is really important. And another thing is diversity. So how, how can you diversify your, uh, your ideas uh, important point for managing process. So um, I, think it's, it, I think it's the best way to explain the point of these things, uh, comparing uh, business models with a business plan. So basically for business plan, you, you have to make kind of detailed, um, detailed business plan, but I think it's really great, but in a sense it takes time and it's, it takes time to get the feedback. But if you use business models, um, you can probably the business model is much simpler than business plan. So you might miss some details, but you can you can make uh, you can represent your business in a short term. Then you can get feedback um, in a short time, short short time, and you can sort of explore different possibilities. Then I I think for business model prototyping or like applying design approach, another point is like. Diversify, diversification of ideas. So you can, um, you can represent your ideas in a short time, but at the same time, you have to diversify your ideas and converge uh, findings to identify what's the right business models. So I think now business model canvas is really popular too. So it's, um, it's much simpler than like making business, mod, uh, business plan so many people use these tools to make a kind of represent uh, your business. So actually, I used these tools for business modeling workshops many times. And um, I actually really love that tools. But um, I think it's, it's really a good tool. But for me, um, I always uh, encourage the participants to use multiple business model canvases and actually some experts also say, don't, don't stick to one, one idea or one canvas. It's better to explore different ones. But somehow I feel like it's quite difficult to convince the participants. So I sort of map out like business model tools. Then I think, well, most simple, um, most simple sort of tools is like kind of list of examples. So some, some list include like 80 business models and stuff. Then um, another one is like a framework. So business model canvas is basically like a framework. Then another, another shape is like uh, network models. So it's more accurate, but it's slightly more complicated. Um, then actually, um, sort of what I observed is um, even business model canvas might be a bit complicated for like business beginners and um, when, when you explore business models. I think it's really good tool for analyzing or like identifying what's the most um, uh, riskiest assumption, but um, sometimes it takes time to um, explore different ideas. Then I, I think kind of list of examples are a bit boring, so it, it takes time to read. So I thought here, here would be some opportunity for design approach to contribute in, in that space. <coughs> so may sort of simply, simplified and kind of engaging tools 
could be useful for um, business model, uh, business modeling. So that's, that's why I made uh, stretch. Um, so I think business model canvas has nine building blocks, but if you go back to the definition of a um, business model by uh, the, the author, I think it can be just divided for four elements. So what's the value of business models and how to create the value and how to deliver the value and how to capture the value. So capture the value means how to monetize the value, basically. So we, we made a kind of basic formation of business models for stretch into four elements. Then actually there are many patterns, but we reduced, reduced it to 12 patterns. So it has just 48 cards. So I think there are many ways to play, but so far I think play like a Uno, playing like a Uno is the best way. So basically each player has some cards and put one card, one, one card each and kind of dis discuss what the business model story behind the business models. So, um, so this is a um, kind of image of uh, when, when, we, when we tried. Oh, sorry, it's not really good uh, quality. But, um, so like we, we made um, different types of business model patterns through the playing game. Then after that, we kind of discussed you know, what, what it could be and we sort of changed the elements to, to identify sort of what, what's the better combination and stuff like this. And another way is like, so we, we made kind of patterns and we, we named each kind of patterns or like formation. Then it's much easier to remember what, what we actually came up with through the session. So basically, the, the, this is a very simple tool. So there are many different ways to play. So that's um, point. So I think if I just go back to the conclusion, so, so I think best best way to prototype business model is like, so you should, you, you should, keep, you should keep agility. I mean, you have to focus on how to, how to get feedback very quickly and how to diversify your ideas in the short term. So hopefully this stretch can help you guys to, to do that. And uh, we actually prepared a special discount and we've got some <laughs> packs actually. So if you're interested, then just talk to, talk to me later. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Um, and Lorna, do you want to come up? I'm going to now introduce our final speaker. So Lorna Dallas-Conte, who is also uh, works here at CSM um, in um, MA Innovation Management and also MA Applied Imagination in the Creative Industries. Um, she's an experienced business advisor and creator of various programs for the creative industries and has worked at a number of uh, organizations such as the Craft Council and the Design Council and the Arts, Ca and Arts Council England. So extremely familiar with the creative and cultural industries and bringing uh, business thinking into that and is going to share with us some of her recent work um, working with a new transdisciplinary arts organization who is trying to develop a new sustainable business model. I hope that what I'm going to say will overlap and link in with the other two speakers. And I'm also going to be quite guarded with what I'm going to tell you because one of the reasons that you have a business model or a business plan is to communicate to other people. And some of the things that I'm doing are less formed and less ready for publication yet. And some of it is a distillation of a practice that goes back nearly 50 years. So um, you're getting quite a, a distilled version in 10 minutes. Um, I'm also going to expose myself. This is uh, not like that, but like this. Um, <laughs> This is an event that I held in May 2006, and what you're looking at is an example of creative practice. Looks quite exciting, quite impressive. There's an audience, there's some nice colours, there's a bit of fire. Um, actually, that's not what you should be looking at. <laughs> you're supposed to be looking at a delicately turning um, maypole of Indian rope, lines to the sky, rotating beautifully. Unfortunately, the um, windscreen wiper motor that was to engage the slowly circulating ropes went up when the guy that you can just about see here 
set fire to it. We ended up with a towering inferno, which was more impressive than we'd intended. But it's a really good example of a plan not going to plan, and yet you ending up with something even more impressive. And um, I could go on at length, but I think that's what I want to talk about. Um, so I would also like to qualify the fact that I'm not a pure academic. I actually come from a professional practice background. I have an entrepreneurial and creative family. Um, I've got an associate of the Chartered Institute of Bankers, so I turned right when I went out of school instead of left. I'm very proud to have an MA in Design Studies, which is the previous Applied Imagination version. Um, I've also set up and run a number of different businesses of my own, so using my entrepreneurial um, genetics. I've been a designer maker. I've been a director of 40 people in a bookshop that was an independent bookshop before social enterprise was known or understood. And um, I've set up a gallery, <coughs> created a company that was a consultant to the Design Council. I'm currently a freelancer as well as an hourly paid lecturer in universities. And I've also been an executive director of a charity that was in the arts sector. So I've done quite a few different types of business model. Um, I've also been a business support person, um, both within the bank, which was an international bank, but also within a range of different publicly funded um, uh, entities, such as Solitech, Business Link, the Design Council, the Patent Office, I've done some work for them. In fact, I was responsible for the research that set up artist resale rights. Um, I also created a programme, I was the first creative industries business advisor for the South East and it started off as a small project which was where our original photograph came in. I'm also a mentor and a coach. So I've got this really odd background that doesn't like to stay still very, off, very long but also goes quite deeply into what I do. So I just want to know how many of you in the room have actually written a business plan? Oh great, good. And um, how many people use business models? Okay, fewer. That's interesting. Okay. So um, I've written a number of different ones. A simple one was the gallery, which took me a few hours to write um, to raise an overdraft back in the day. And um, when I was running the charity, I wrote a 100-page business plan for the board. Um, I've also written and supported people to write business plans through the CBAS project, through enterprise hubs, and through different arts development areas for local authorities. I'm trained to evaluate business plans. And I've also tried writing with new language for that project, um, a different form of plan to try and get round creative practice needing different languages. I've used business model canvas and um, I've taught it as a part of an MBA at UCA. But I've also had feedback like this from one of the Hot House participants. Um, I've been working with Crafts Council Hot House for about five years now. And this isn't untypical of the sort of feedback I get. I get amazing, it was really wonderful. And then people really struggling with the language. So I feel as though we're still trying to pin butterflies, that we're trying to put a language set onto an activity that doesn't sit well, that even the notion of business is alien to some people with creative practice. And so I'm quite interested in how we might be able to do something about that. Um, one of the reasons that I'm concerned is that we still haven't nailed it. The financial rewards are still really depressed. If you look at figures 2010, artists on average were earning less than £10,000, whereas illustrators and designers at that time were earning an average of £15,000. I've just been to a conference in Thanet where they're celebrating the regeneration, and they very proudly said that they've got a number of new businesses, but people are still in the arts sector earning under £15,000. Um, I didn't think that that was something to celebrate. I, I th thought that that was something that looked a bit more like exploitation to me. Um, we are talking about funding dependent government funded organisations. There was a piece in Arts Professional just a few weeks ago about trying to diversify incomes. I tried to do that when I ran the, uh, the charity to help try to stop the organisation being funding dependent after 25 years. 
And it's a tough call, and it's not something that you can do quickly. Um, so I'm concerned about regeneration and gentrification. Um, I think often we're still in a position where the creative practitioners that bring the life and the energy to areas <coughs> still miss out on getting the rewards from that gentrification process. The reason that the charity that I tried to save closed was because the landlords wanted to put the rent up. Um, we also struggle within the design sector between design as a commodity and design as a consultancy practice. We still haven't got the language around that. And so I think it's about perceived value and perceived contributions. Uh, we already know that uh, creative practitioners, this is um, Les McEwen, like to jump off before they get to predictable success. They've already got bored, quite a lot of people, particularly entrepreneurs, by the time they've got through the white water stage. And they're certainly not interested in getting the benefit from being on a treadmill. Um, so I think we're not really looking at what we're seeing. Do we want a plan or do we somehow need to capture emerging ideas? Do we want accountability or do we want freedom and flexibility? Are we trying to impose a process and a structure or are we looking at something that prefers in some instances to avoid a process and need and support unstructured um, interactions. I also think we're missing a trick with understanding creative, creative energies. It takes a huge amount of energy to often have an enormous vision that can take many years to come into fruition. And yet that same energy can be switched on a penny to come up with attention to detail that brings that vision into life. Our creative practitioners, this is all known, are really good at working with the unknown, the unexpected, and they're brilliant at negotiating and wrestling and shaping a form to come somewhere close to the vision that they had initially. And sometimes it goes beyond that. When I'm making my own work, by the way, I have an art practice as well as all the rest of it, um, often I have a conversation with the piece of work that I'm making that I didn't know I was going to have when I first thought about what this piece of work would look like. And I have to allow that piece of work to speak to me, which a plan wouldn't enable me to achieve. And so creative practitioners benefit from the support of knowing and understanding people, and also from balancing input and output. Um, so I've strung up a whole load of, of um, illustrations of people that I think have been listening to creative practitioners and could perhaps be used to draw upon to help create new frameworks. Um, I won't list them because I've only got two minutes left. Um, however, just to stress that they are a variety of people talking over quite a long period of time. Um, also, a business um, excellence model, which was something that I worked on with the Design Council in one of the iterations. I think creative practice doesn't measure up to many of those results in those type of boxes. I think often the creative practitioner is both their audience as well as the maker before the object or the thinking or the process, whatever they're coming up with, goes out into the wider world. And I don't think we quite catch that in, in helpful ways. Um, I think if we return to something like Maslow, we also might get some clues because we're splashed across Maslow. We don't operate... Um, in the layers. So I think although we're beginning to, um, this is Charles and Ray Eames, if you don't recognise them, the furniture designers being pinned by their own furniture. I think we're beginning to be able to articulate some of the benefits of being the butterflies, but I don't think that we've perhaps got the language that is capturing that totality and exploiting and, and taking um, more use from. So I'm proposing a new framework um, that really looks at purpose and value, very much based on the role of research and development within creative practice. It's something that's often squished by funding. And looking again at the energies that are required and expended, and then the returns, because some of the returns you can work 
for many nights on the trot with a piece of work and actually end up feeling elated at the end and not exhausted. And so creative practice shows us that we can use our energies in a very different way, and that's certainly not within a business plan. Um, I have another list of references that I'm going to be using in the piece of work that I'm working on at the moment, and they're really worth a look. Some of them I give to my dissertation students, uh, and a couple of conferences um, that I've been to recently, and one that I'm speaking at on pedagogy um, shortly. So our butterflies are here within something like the Natural Histories Pavilion, Butterfly Pavilion, so that we can observe them without damaging them in their habitat, without pinning them down. And so what I'm creating is a new residency program, which will observe creative practice in real time. So it will have an artist question. It will probably combine traditional and new technologies. And it will look at the way that creative practice transfers knowledge between creative practitioners and will look for new frameworks that will quantify these different languages around purpose and value and how research and development brings that into fruition. It will also establish the byproducts which seem to go um, to one side, Twitter, which is very much in the news at the moment, was a byproduct of the technical company that brought that into being. I'm also quite keen on, on what's considered to be developing capacity. I would love that we repositioned where a creative practitioner exists within society rather than keep trying to take their processes and put them in other areas. And um, my aim is to create sustainable practice in new ways. And um, some of the work that I'll be doing, Reese, the lean startup that was mentioned earlier, also Reeves, who, Martin Reeves, who talks about an immune system and development evaluation. And just to take something from Linda Hill, I really am interested in the creative practitioner not benefiting from their ability to be a creative resist. We need that creative resist and we need the professionals that are capable of doing that. And this model explains why. Um, and so here's another one that I prepared earlier. We did actually get the Indian rope trick working the next time we did it. And that was a 15 foot high flaming snowflake in the middle of December, which was quite a fun thing to put on. And it's that sort of thing that I want to be able to do metaphorically. I want people to see the difference. Thank you. Thank you. So we've had quite different talks here. Jamie helping us think about the terminology of business models and imaginaries and surfacing the question of what kind of new forms, what kind of new v v uh, things, new realities are brought into being and the difference between the model and the thing that it represents, the relationship between those two things. Yoshi gave us an example of... Um, taking um, a very well-known example of the, bus the business model canvas and then turning that into a practical tool for managers, for entrepreneurs to think about the models that they might bring into reality. Um, and then finally, Lorna um, emphasised um, in creative practices of different kinds within the arts and within craft and design the kinds of processes that are tied up with those and how those may often resist planning and then they may resist um, codification, formulation and so on that we expect to, in, in frameworks and in plans but nonetheless a part of funding regimes and, and the uh, capturing of value. So we've had these three different um, takes on this topic. So has anyone got a question at this point or shall I, if you'd like to raise your hand if you have a question for any of the speakers or, for, or a comment if you'd like to make. So we have a question at the back. If you'd like to just introduce yourself, please. Hello. Okay. Um, thanks very much for the cards. That looks really interesting. So that's a question for Yoshi, is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just, um, I'm just curious. Have you used these cards actually in like in the actually making of business models? And also, um, once you've done your game, like playing with the cards, how do you actually capture the results and the communicate the outcome of your? playing with the car to the outside world. The, the tool was used for hackathon already, but it, it wasn't really exactly like making business models, but la, rather kind of um, studying about like 
what's the business models and something like this. And then actually we, we did a kind of test sessions <coughs> in times and then yeah I, I had a kind of similar questions how to how to record what you know what, what you made. I think the one way is um like just taking pictures of each formation and um, I think best way is to, to, to name it basically. Um, that's the so far is the best way. They, um, I'm yeah I'm still kind of exploring the way to kind of record in a best better way. Yeah. Would you actually recommend using this with the canvas, with or is it actually like a totally separate game? Or uh, with uh, I think uh, I think probably right now I think with it's better. So you you use the cards first, then identify good good ideas, then move to a business model canvas. Uh, it's also a question for um, Tsuyoshi about this game because I feel like a canvas, for example, it's an, an open in like you have. M Infinite, you can have infinite ideas, like it's very open, so it's a blank paper, blank paper, so you can write everything. Mm -hmm. But I feel like with this card, so you kind of feel maybe limited or something like that. So, how can you mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? How yes. can you manage? Yes, I, I think uh, that's so that's why, but I think it's it's I think the pattern is limited in a sense, but at the same time, it has like so it's it's for. Elements and it has 12 patterns. So actually, in total, the formation can be 20,000 patterns, I mean, formations. So, in a sense, I think it's almost unlimited. And I think key point is I, actually, I named the two stretch because probably ideas are already in your head. Then the two is just to help you to stretch your mind to find that idea. So, I think, I think that would be good to use that too for exercise, then maybe you can move to a business model canvas, then you know, you, your mind might be more stretched or like creative to find something. Also building on that, um, thank you very much. I just had the question again, maybe I missed it, who's the target group of the mm -hmm. game that you invented? Is that design students? Well, initially it was um, kind of novice entrepreneurs. I mean, actually the number of entrepreneurs are growing. So I, so I realized like, many people who study or who try to make businesses are less experienced than before. So you know, you, sometimes you don't have clear idea about, about what its business models and stuff like this. So that's the kind of main target initially. But right, so then actually I, I explore different possibilities. Then I, I think there are many kind of business teachers or like people who run hackathons and stuff. I think they, they are really interested in that too. And I also met a person who teach like business English, then he's quite interested in that too as well. I mean, to teach um, kind of business languages and stuff like that. So it's not limited to design and art, like artistic? Uh, no, uh, not right now. So I think okay. maybe for experienced business people, that might be too simple. Mm -hmm. So the basic target is like, those, I mean, unexperienced people, basically. So just, just that, right now. Uh, and another question would be, what's your understanding of value that you underlie mm -hmm. uh, the kind of um, building or construction of your game? The value? Yeah, what's your understanding of value? Like, which facets can it have? And uh -huh. so what's the ground that you used to set this up? Oh, you mean the, using the, the tool itself? Yeah, the like, value. yeah. Well, I think so. I think most important point is like to to explore, dif uh, to see kind of different possibilities before you kind of jump in one idea. And when I, I think that's I think biggest risk for startups. I think so. That that's that's why I kind of developed that too. That uh, I think I was more meaning like theoretical background. Uh -huh. uh, what kind of do you think value is, and what kind of value is intended to be created uh -huh. because there are of course many facets as economic value social value cultural value economic um, environmental value all kinds of value so all mm -hmm. oh, right so I thought that it could it could have like some, some social value to to support like um, support novice entrepreneurs to develop their business I mean even if they don't have like deep business 
background or like knowledge. So that's what I thought. Uh, so just a uh, few, but I think it goes back to what has already been uh, asked. Like, have you uh, studied the dynamic of of when teams use your game? Like, because I think context and the process of playing it mm -hmm. uh, has a huge impact on the outcome. Because I experienced myself that when you play games mm -hmm. in certain processes, it's quite limiting. You kind of focus on, okay, do I do is this in the correct way? What are the rules? And mm -hmm. kind of like really narrowing down to small cards. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's very crucial to also look at the context, how you play a game to kind of have creative mm -hmm. results, if you mm -hmm. want to say so. Right. I think... Probably, I think you be, better situations like there is some facilitator. So one of them have uh, good good knowledge about you know what's the business models, and then that person can encourage you know how, how to speak. And uh, but I think in a sense um, one advantage of using that tool is to in a sense I think force the players to to speak up because they use, they have to use a card. So in a sense you know they. Uh, sometimes people don't really speak up, right, in the situation. But I think it, that's um, sometimes helpful for them to encourage. What are the conditions that allow us to consider a business a business? Because if we're talking about, like, uh, if we have our matters of concern and it's how to turn them into a, into action, we can do so. But but is that already a business, or is there more steps to it? Is it in the modeling or unmodeling? Is it in the success of that modeling or unmodeling? I don't know, I don't know if I'm <laughs> making sense, but. That's a really good question. It's, uh, so what would make a business a business? Um, even if we all have our concerns and we want to act on them, why, why would we construct, um, why would we construct some concerns in our actions about them as design? as designing and, and my son as a business. Um, I think um, the simplest response would be um, how you, manif how you um, take, how you t take control of the skills that are at your, at your disposal. Um, so uh, if, if you, are working or have worked in design or if you are working with people and designing is part of what you do or what you might envisage for yourself as a as a way to um, to making an impact then it might go along that route um, I think I think in terms of um, a business um, and, I'm, and I'm and I'm trying to think of the word business um, because we use it also in, um, is this your business to be interested, to be doing this thing? Um, or mind your own business or those sorts of things. And it's, uh, what is it that would, uh, that would drive us to turn something that we are concerned about into a business? I mean, a business is, is where you, it seems to me, is where you are um, expressing um, in a very open and um, engaged way that you have something to do with something or other that's going on in the world. Um, that may be very... Your, your main concern might be simply to generate loads of cash for yourself. Um, okay, fair enough, and you find out way, find out a way of, of, of making that work. But I'm, I, I'm thinking, it's you know, what is it that you make your business about? You know, what is your business? Um, how you organise and structure the um, uh, the resources under your uh, in your purview in order to do something. Well, that could, you could do that in a million ways. So you do that in whichever way you think is, is right for you. And I'm thinking of you in, in your plural because you may not be alone, you know, a lone entrepreneur, but you might have a number of people working with you on something. I, I want to push this a little more because mm. um, Jamie's course is um, one example of bringing this kind of thinking uh, and bringing students into this kind of university who 
are not necessarily makers, artists, designers. They're operating inside organisational contexts. Um, and we also uh, are about to launch an MBA, um, which Pamela Yeo here is the course leader of, launching in September, jointly with Birkbeck College. So this is um, an example of art and design institutions taking seriously this idea that um, the kinds of practices that Lorna was describing and many people in this room probably have or know of, uh, have something to say to social problems, organisational challenges, and, th and that, that business is our business too. Um, and so there's different organisational forms emerging in this university. So actually, Pam, I was, would you like to come in at this point and say I something? Want to ask, I wanted to ask a question. Okay, <laughs> can, can we get you the mic? Um, can, I, can I, while that's happening, yeah. can I... Um, I, I find, um, and the reason I went on about my um, past was because I have had, a, in some respects, a very traditional business past as well. I didn't really go into that. And I actually have a problem with the word business now. And I'm not sure, I think we need a paradigm shift. I don't think we're looking for business, we're looking for busyness, meaning a why instead of an I. And I think this is what I'm meaning by we're looking but not seeing. I think so many of our infrastructure, <coughs> large infrastructure um, uh, descriptors are causing us real problems at the moment. We've got a lot of disruption going on, and so we're seeing the main blocks of what we consider to be our economics, our society, all sorts of things are beginning to crumble. And I was describing this um, earlier to somebody like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And uh, we're seeing this as a wonderful piece of architecture. If you take the problem with the banks, seeing as I'm actually a trained banker, um, you know, that we've seen it topple, haven't we? And it was supported and it's gone back up again. But actually, I think it will happen again. And the whole of banking is just confidence. That is what banking is about. It's about confidence. And I think that we are looking at new ways of creating value. I think even the word value is causing me problems at the moment. And I think what we've done is we've pinned the butterfly rather than understood what the butterfly does by its very nature. When we're putting, as human beings, in extreme situations, we create. You've only got to look at trench art. I'm about to go and do a piece of work on the Somme next week. People drew butterflies. They didn't go and make money. And I think that is what we need to be re-engineering using that creativity within us. And there's a bunch of people, those, those references, that are giving us the tools to do that. And I'm quite happy to be quite extreme about this because I've used a lot of business plans. I've written a lot of plans. Can I can I can I say something as well? I think I think that was one of the reasons um, that Lorne has just articulated with rethinking the word business um, was one of the reasons also why I focused on the the concept of concern um, and that you know if we're going to think that a business is a going concern, well, what are we bloody concerned about? Mm -hmm. And 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 it may well be that that taking any action over things we are concerned about is business, um, in the same way that it's designed. I mean, you know, and, and all that's different is the, is the skills or the materials that we might use. Um, and it may, they may operate actually in, um, or their impact may well be the same. Um, and I think on, on, on that note, there's something that, that Yoshi said was really grabbed me and the, that, that, that idea in, in one of his replies of, of there are many new entrepreneurs, first time entrepreneurs starting. And that tells you something about employment and maybe unemployment. And it tells you something about how it is that our communities are acting um, so that... Um, People who would otherwise have been unemployed um, are finding it necessary to start up businesses. Um, there are portfolio careers rather than a single career. Um, there's platform capitalism, so you've got a whole number of different ways in which we may need we may need 
to act on the world because the traditional ways in which we are, our actions in the world have been organised through um, long careers um, are crumbling. So there's all these different things that are that are facilitating or demanding that we that we act in those ways, whether we whether we like it or not. Sometimes I like the idea of um, you know you're talking about the crumbling enterprises and rethinking businesses. Uh, I just wanted to say you know things like what we what we call social enterprise these days. A lot of them were dreamt up, whether they were charities before. Or, you know, so for example, I know of um, quite a few business businesses <laughs> um, uh, in Greece, for example, and you kind of look at Greece and you kind of think it's a country that's going bankrupt, it owes the IMF or whoever more money than it can ever generate in the next three generations or something, and yet they're still thriving. And uh, I had the privilege of going there uh, for a week last April, and uh, we met up with uh, businesses and they were created out of nothing, um, based around social enterprise. So one of them uh, had this idea that they would use olive oil generated from olive pl um, plantations or vine vineyards. <laughs> um, and these farmers were not doing much with the olives apart from just sort of like putting them in big tanks and selling them to grannies in the villages who can't afford to buy them. So they decided to repackage them. So using some kind of marketing tool, you know, branding. So all the business tools that we use, we think of as business, uh, sold it to consumers, not for a lot more money, but just, you know, average money that you pay for olive, good, really good olive oil. But what they use the um, uh, profits went back to uh, uh, orphanage, orphanages and uh, churches and all that that were su supporting the crumbling economy. And that was actually driven by a marketing manager who was working in a so-called, as you would call, a traditional marketing business, you know, in a proper job. Um, she didn't have to do this charity work, social enterprise thing, but she did. And as a result of that, she got lots of uh, awards from the government, um, social enterprise councils and what have you, and, and it's been very successful. But my point is that, you know, the, the going concern, I think, is very important. So whether we have this burning desire to do right for the orphanage, uh, for the orphans in, in, in Athens or something, or we want to do right for the farmers, the olive, olive farmers, I think, you know, there was a purpose driven by that. I was just interested in how that is now termed as social enterprise rather than business. But my next question was around how much design do you think um, is thought of in traditional business? You know, you were talking about how maybe an, an one aim, Jamie was talking about how one aim of a business could be making tons of money. So when so. I worked for the Design Council, the work that I did there was to... Um, bring into the Design Council Design Atlas, which was trying to explain how to business, how to use design and how to explain business to designers to act as that bridge and do that translation. And although it is understood better, the concept of design leadership, where you're considered, which is kind of where I come from, which is about considering for slightly longer than the year of a going concern the impact of all that we do and how our connections contribute to other people. And so understanding when to take value and when not to take value. So one of my references is The Gift by Lewis Hythe, which some of you may have already come up with. And that was about um, the value of something that's exchanged, even when it's broken down, can increase in value when it remains with the community and loses certain types of value when it becomes owned by one person. And I think in re-engineering or reappropriating the word busy and busyness, we can reconsider how we use our time and how we use our resource and how those things together benefit each other. And it is radical early thinking that 
almost by using some of the languages that are traditionally used by business, we can almost go the other side of it and find that difference. And that's what I mean about, I think I've always worked as this bridge, this translator, but I've discovered that even that translation is missing something. It's always been anxious to me that I've never quite articulated the two sides. And I think that's what we could work on, that we could go beyond, which is transdisciplinarity, which is where the residency will be. <laughs> Any other questions? So I've got one, which is this <clears throat> about the translation. And in a sense, Yoshi's card deck is a, tra a translation. Mm -hmm. The business model canvas is a different kind of translation. Um, an MA program is a translation. Um, mm -hmm. the residency programs that you're setting up, um, the Design Atlas program. So I, I just wanted if we might think about the role of art and design institutions or art and design universities specifically, since we're many of us working or studying in one. What is the role of an art and design higher education institution in um, creating um, different kinds of translations? Um, I would think that an art and design institution um, is, an, is an engine for concerns um, and, and, and maybe also an, an engine for, um, for the production of responses to concerns. Um, I think um, maybe, maybe that's true of all, um, of all education, actually. Um, and maybe what an art design um, or an arts um, sector higher education can be is um, is uh, an engine for the production of of create of creativity um, of um, creative um, specifically creative. Uh, um, expressions or reactions uh, to to what concern us or what concerns us as a um, as a as a community or a culture or a set of intersecting cultures so if that is right then does the university uh, need to play a stronger role in defining its concerns and its publics because if the more traditional art school model, the student comes with their concern and they, they have their concern, their area of inquiry, their thing. But actually, should the university guide us towards some concerns more than others? Um, I, would, I would urge against that massively. Um, I think the concerns that are, that are, um, that are expressed by the by the people that work in these institutions are the most important. And, and I, I include students as people who work in these institutions. Um, and, you know, those of us who've, who've worked here for 22 years, um, <laughs> you know, our, our concerns might be rather different. And, and it, may, it may well be that, that um, the one thing that keeps me going is being enlivened by the concerns of the of the students that sort of come through my door. Um, um, I think the the concerns of the university as of a university, for example, as a large institution within its sector, aren't to be ignored, and I think they're important, um, and they have a have a have a part to play within um, within the. Uh, within the networks of relationships within which they sit, um, but I don't think that the university, as at that at that certain level of hierarchical relationships, should be top down directing what the concerns of the rest of us should be. Maybe in a way that that direction of the concern, because how much academia should shape or unshape the concerns of the people involved in, in that environment and by shape or unshape I mean like why is it academia and I don't mean CSM but why is it academia so obsessed with like the tools and the practices and the methods and the theories instead of like the motivations 
or with the, or, or more of the personal things that go with the concern rather than the practical stuff to move forward into something different. Uh, can I? Yes, good yeah, point. Can I? Uh, so I would suggest, from my perspective, that a university should be a place where the individual has the opportunity to be transformed through research and development. And that research and development opportunity can be like breathing. It's something that comes in and goes out through the university, but that that permeability is allowed in an open way to discuss things which perhaps there isn't an opportunity outside academia. And I think we've kind of lost some of that in, in this accountability that comes with funding and, and other aspects of accountability. And by having that open breathing, you're able to exchange knowledge, challenge knowledge, perhaps reinvent knowledge, and then end up with new understandings of value and purpose. So I've got quite a, an aspirational, I'm not sure that's what we live up to, but that's, that's, that's what I see academia as the place to be. The, the, if I can just add on to that. Um, I think uh, the, the point that you just made um, uh, from, from the audience, um, I think is a really good one, and and you know I, it made me think as you were talking about it that you know are there moments within the cultural and political lives um, of all of us when a university should be mo saying something about something, um, and it it may well be. Um, I would like to think that the um, if there are important political or cultural or social. Um, uh, social things that we should be concerned about that they should be bubbling up from from the people that that um, that form form the basis of the organisation. Um. It seems that there was a suggestion maybe that the way that businesses are valued is that system is kind of broken. That that businesses are valued in the wrong way. You know, depending on how we determine what the value is. Um, and I was wondering whether outside of spaces like this and institutions like this, what kind of um, revaluing or, or re-evaluation of the value of business is happening in the more traditional world? Um, I, the reason I ask that is because I, I ran a creative business. We, we sold a commodity uh, and we got to a point where we were talking to investors and, you know, that's when you took that arc of yours that you had on the screen and you sort of reached that point and it's all great and exciting. And then you speak to those investors and you, you're delivered the same approach by every single investor. Uh, and you know, it, it can become quite patronizing where it's like, it's okay, you do the creative stuff and we'll look after the rest, you know, and then we'll all get rich together. Um, but it's, it's such a, <laughs> it, it, it's not an attractive proposition to a, to a creative business for somebody you know, uh, an institution or, or, or an individual to come in and approach a business in that way. So I just wonder whether outside of spaces like this, if you've encountered any sort of value, uh, like value redefinition, I suppose, uh, of, of businesses or any research that's happening in that space. So when it comes to investment, the discussion is very different. You know, it's about human capital, relational capital, things like that, rather than just what's the bottom line, how much are going to invest and how much am I going to get out? There were some of the references that I gave are new research on value propositions and um, how value is engineered within creative practice. So yes, there are people looking at it, but I still don't think it goes far enough. And I'm quite interested to try to find this fineness, to, to look at, so this object of making lots of money is so limiting. It's those other um, which social enterprise tries to to capture, but there's other stuff as well. And it's how how can we incorporate this humanity into frameworks that work for the benefit of more people than the few that make vast sums of money and that aren't very good at sharing them. And how can we re-engineer that? I'm quite interested in that. And the people that are looking at that, and that's what the program will 
help to put a lens on? I think the 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 um, the description of people or uh, cultural values in terms of capital, um, I I find um, appalling. Um, so these these phrases like human capital or cultural capital or social capital um, proves to me that capitalism has <coughs> coded all of those things because what capital does what capitalism does is to code the flows of the world as capital um, so to talk about human capital is to is utterly to call all of us cap capitalist items um, so I think a reevaluation. Re I love this reevaluation of all values because it's a subtitle of a Nietzsche book, but um, <laughs> or thereabouts, uh, which is always good for me. Um, but um, or, or something like that. But um, I think you know a reevaluation of all of these things would need very at the, at the very first not to talk about people as human capital and not to talk about culture as cultural capital or social capital. I think. Bourdieu, is it, who yeah. starts this yeah. off, I think has a lot to answer for. Okay, um, I don't know if I can answer your question, but I think there are lots of uh, successful traditional traditional businesses, so those people who are making lots of money, supposedly, um, who have things like what they call the triple bottom line. So they call them the people, the planet, the profits. So we're concerned with profits, yes, of course. We're concerned with our people, and of course people is you and me working for them, but also our customers, our stakeholders, blah, blah, blah. And then there's also um, the planet. So whether uh, it's about you know, climate change or uh, switching off the lights or using recycled paper, or actually it's also about sustainability of the business. So you know, we set up a business, it's gonna go for longevity, we can grow, you know, treat our people well, develop them so they don't leave, we, we have their human capital within the business. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think um, for what's it worth, um, things like the time, I think the FT has a um, top 100 um, best businesses to work for and they break it down into small, uh, you know, big categories, small categories and all that. And if you look at the top, you know, however many you want within that particular industry, a lot of the stories um, I guess they're biased because you know they're written by people, but I think a lot of the stories are more than just oh we make you know a ten million profit every year sort of thing. A lot of it has you know elements of uh, what they might call leadership development, people development. Uh, they have people not called director of human resources or human capital, but director of people. So this sense that we are working for the people. I think Jamie and I had a interesting conversation this afternoon about <clears throat> HR and <laughs> and um, yeah so you know the understanding that perhaps the director of people would be working for all of us as opposed to making sure that our business doesn't you know break a rule if we sack you or you know that kind of thing which which, which is very sort of like functional um, yes we can't break rules but I think it's more than that you know why do we need to you know make someone uh, sack someone if we can sort of rectify it before you know sort of thing. So I think there are, there are good businesses out there. Um, perhaps it's, it's about making sure that the value um, of arts and design schools are either made clearer or seen clearer or seen to be more beneficial to the business world. I'm not saying it's not beneficial. In contrast, I think it's very, very necessary. But for whatever reason, arts or design has been seen as you know, of little value if people who are earning less than fifteen thousand pounds is seen as a point of celebration is, is is something to be shouting about. So I think it's it's about that. Okay, that. I wanna end with a final question for anybody, which is several people that is not just one. Why why are we talking about business modeling? Were we talking about it ten years ago? Not so much. Business plans, yes. Why business modelling? Why has that? Why why has this become the focus? Has anyone got some thoughts about that? Because everything is changing all the time. We're in, <laughs> living in a world of uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> but wasn't it ten years ago? You know, uh, dot, go back to the dot com time. People would have said change, uncertainty, new technology, blah blah. 
but we weren't using the, the term, we weren't reaching for business models in quite the same way. Peter? Yes, uh, that was also one point I was thinking about. So when I was a student, we talked about sustainability from cradle to grave. We talked about responsibility uh, for the planet and uh, for the society. There was a business issue to get a job at the end of the day and make a living. But today everything is really um, uh, breaking broken down to uh, financial terms and condition. And uh, after the Lehman Brothers crisis, everything is now to be quantified. And I think uh, even the creative part is to be more and more quantified and breaking it down to, to business and to make a value proposition. Rather than doing it sometimes for fun, is not always a value proposition, but you have to find a value behind everything to materialize everything. So I think this is quite a sick development to some extent on how to move against and find alternative rules and responsibilities within the uh, university of, of creativity is, I think, one of the major causes for this society. There's two sides of it, and it's one like finding meaning or value for whatever it is that we do, and the other one is like profiting because we all live in the same capitalism or capitalist world, and we need to like kind of to, to say it in a way tribe. And it, wa it wasn't different 10 years ago, but probably the speed is quicker and, and the need to see result, results are, are there. So we're like constantly trying to model a business out of, and, it's, and, and the question is weird because for me it's like, it's not the case. I'm, I'll rather stay away <laughs> as much as possible. Like I'm struggling with the businesses and I don't like, oh, no, I don't want businesses. I'll rather like do, <laughs> I don't know, paperwork or yeah, I don't know, crafts at home or something like that instead of running a business. But but we're all very, like it's it's a mindset nowadays in which like you have to, if not like you're failing. It's like this idea that if you're not like a business person, then, then who are you? <laughs> I think it is a fashion, like a framing that just meets needs or desires of like our entrepreneurial society. And the good thing about it is probably that it's, it can be shaped, so fashion can change. And I think uh, we have, I don't know, it's, it's uh, the connotations might be quite like negative. That's a good point to start out to say, okay, how can we do this in a better way, human-centered, in a design way, and use kind of, I don't know, aesthetic experience and kind of uh, time to really develop socially, economically, culturally valuable solutions uh, and also economically because I think per se economic kind of focus and, and business per se is not a negative, it came a bit across here like a connotation, it's very kind of it's necessary and uh, it's, I think it's just a challenge to align those value, yeah that's just the word, if you align values in different kind of uh, constellations to a different certain time and I think the models are good playgrounds uh, if they're played well for that, yeah. Why are we talking about business mo models these days? Why do you think? Um, I think that business um, plans are very stiff. And um, I think we realize like, in the world of, of internet, things are changing quicker. And, uh, and business plans always try to predict things a little bit. But how can it be? And by modeling, it's like active doing, responding to it to change. I think that, that was a really good point. Um, I quite like this business model idea. Um, I, th I think a plan, to me, a plan is about getting somewhere. Um, so it has that sort of strategic, um, that strategic element to it. So how is it that I get from where I am to where I want to be over there? Um, I think a model is, uh, gives you a shape rather than a direction um, to an end point. And that shape doesn't, doesn't need to be teleological, um, uh, end-focused. And I think the, um, that, that idea of when you have them both together, so you have the, an, uh, uh, something that's shaped, that's on a journey, um, that you absolutely must revisit. So you, 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 cannot, you cannot keep that shape all the way through that planned journey. And if you're, if you're a business person or a designer or whatever worth your salt, you are, you are constantly revisiting that, however complicated and difficult 
um, that might be. So I, I think understanding the shape as well as the direction is really, is really important. And so back to ontologies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'd like to close it there and um, thank all the contributors, um, Jamie Brassett, Sayoshi Amano, and Lorna Dallas Conte, for, and also all of you, um, especially those who asked questions and participated in the discussion. Thank you very much. And uh, if you are, have not noticed, there is a whole two weeks of events called UAL Research Fortnight. Um, and this is part of that. Um, it starts today and there's a whole set of things and strongly recommend you have a look at the program because there's a whole range of sort of research like we had today, PhD research, researcher research, practitioner research and um, celebrating and bringing, bringing these into view. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.